Okay, welcome everyone to the July 20th, 2021 Open Planetary Lunch. It is the anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, and at least partly in uh, in recognition of that event. It's also uh, uh, Jeff Bezos launched himself into orbit today. The oldest and the youngest ever astronaut uh, made it into space today. So partly in recognition of that event, Mark uh, Wazorek is going to give his second OP lunch talk. This one is on the history of lunar exploration. Thank you, Mark, for giving your second talk. And when you are ready, just uh, go ahead. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me to give another talk this year. And today what I'm gonna do is try to give you a brief overview of how hum humanity has viewed and studied the moon over time. And this will be from antiquities all the way up until the present day with the, the recent launches of these billionaires into space. And part of the motivation for this talk is that we are currently celebrating a 50th year anniversary of the Apollo program. Uh, just over two years ago, or just two years ago exactly, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, where we landed the first humans on the surface of the moon. And late next year, we will also be celebrating or, or commemorating the launch of Apollo 17, which was the last of the Apollo missions. Now, what I'm going to try to do in this talk is to show that Apollo actually is, is very important for understanding how the moon works and understanding its geologic evolution, how the moon formed and so on. But it turns out that Apollo is just only one chapter of humankind's exploration of the moon and that this exploration started a long, long, long time ago and continues up until the present day. Okay, so I'm gonna start at the very beginning uh, for this talk. And this is 300,000 years ago when modern ho uh, homo sapiens appeared on the earth in Africa. And at this point in time, these, these people were more or less the same as we are today. And they must certainly have looked up in the sky and noticed the moon. And it wouldn't have taken too much uh, study to realize that the phases of the moon repeat themselves roughly every 29 days. And if they had good eyesight, uh, at least better than my eyesight, they could have seen these dark and white spotches on the moon. And they would have probably wondered, you know, what is the moon and what are these black and white spots on the moon? Now, the first known depiction that we have of the moon and also the cosmos, in fact, comes from a bronze disc um, that is about 30 centimeters in diameter that's called the Nebra sky disc. And this was found in 1999 in Germany. And this, this was dated to about 1600 BC and is, comes from the Bronze Age. And with this bronze disc, we can see depictions of the sun, of the moon, and some stars, and probably some constellations. Now, it's not exactly certain what the intention of the creator of the start of this disc was, but it's been suggest, suggested based on these arcs on the sides of the disc that this may be used to determine when the solstices would occur. And this would be important if you were living in an agrarian society where farming is important and you would like to know when the seasons changed. Now, the first kind of ideas that we have that are written down about the, the kind of nature of the moon comes from the early Greeks, and in particular from Pythagoras about 500 BC. And the Pythagoreans, was, they had a very peculiar school of thought, which was very theoretical, and they believed that the moon and the other objects in the sky were perfectly smooth spherical bodies. And because of this, they thought that the moon was actually just like, like a reflecting mirror up in the sky. And the way that they explained the dark and the white spots, spots on the surface of the moon is that this was just a reflection of the Earth. In particular, the black regions they thought represented the Mediterranean Sea. Now, this idea might seem kind of funny by today's standards, but it's an idea that was repeated throughout history. And one of the more recent uh, cases I found in the literature was about 1600s, where a Roman emperor who was a patron of Kepler believed that he could actually see Italy and the largest islands of Italy just by looking at the surface of the moon. Now, I think this idea was probably put to rest by Leonardo da Vinci uh, in the late 1400s and early 1500s. Now, da Vinci, as we all know, he was a, a genius from the Renaissance period. Uh, he had a good understanding of painting and perspective. He understood optics. 
he was uh, an inventor. And as seen in the bottom left here, he actually made a globe of the earth based on the available uh, cartographic data that he had available at this time. Now, da, Vin da Vinci, he realized that the moon could not be a smooth, polished mirror uh, in the sky. And the reason for this was that as the moon traversed across the sky during the night, when this moon was over here, it would reflect a different portion of the earth than when it was, when it was over here. And what he realized is that this, these black and white spots on the moon, they, never, they don't change in position on the moon. They're fixed and attached to the moon's surface. So these black and white regions are something intrinsic to the moon's surface itself. Now, the next thing that happened was Galileo Galilei, when he invented, in essence, modern astronomy. He took this, uh, this telescope on the left-hand side, which magnified objects by roughly 20 times. And the first thing he did was he turned it towards the moon and drew what he saw. Now, not only did he make observations of the moon, but he also in short order discovered the primary moons of Jupiter, which now bear his name. He saw the phases of Venus, which proved the Copernican worldview where the planets orbited around the sun and not the other way around. And he also did things like observing sunspots and he saw the rings of Saturn. So in terms of his observations of the moon, well, what did he see? Well, this is one of his drawings. And his drawings are, are actually really great because he, he draws them in a way where you can actually interpret what is happening on the surface of the moon. And what he realized is that the surface of the moon is not smooth. And this, the reason for this was because he saw shadows on the moon and these shadows varied in, in orientation during the course of the moon's lunation. And not only that, he paid particular attention to the so-called terminator line. This is the line that separates the sunlit hemisphere, the moon on the left, from the night hemisphere on the right. And as you can see in this drawing, this line is not a straight line. And this is because the moon has valleys and has mountains, just as the Earth does. He also paid particular attention to these circular features that we see on the moon, the, the so-called craters. And as you can see in this, this uh, image here, he drew the shadows in such a way that you can actually interpret what is happening. <clears throat> you can tell that this, this giant crater in the center of this image is actually a depression in the surface of the moon. Okay, so the next person we have uh, who mapped the moon was Johannes Hevelius, who was a Polish astronomer uh, who came about 40 years after Galileo. And he used a telescope that was magnified by roughly 50 times. And what he did was, was very interesting. By, by observing the moon day after day, he realized that he could actually see more than 50% of the moon's surface. What he realized is that the moon in its orbit, um, this was not known at the time, but the moon's orbit was eccentric so, and also inclined to the Earth's ecliptic. And he would see that the moon would kind of wobble back and forth in latitude and also wobble back and forth in longitude. And by making observations at the correct time, he could actually see portions of the far side hemisphere of the moon. And in this map here, the center portion of the map corresponds to the near side. And then you can see there's these kind of extensions on the bottom left and the top right, which represent portions of the far side hemisphere. Now, Hevelius, he also paid particular attention to these circular craters. And he is one of the first people that suggested that these circular craters probably were giant volcanoes. Also, he was one, one of the first people that named these dark uh, mare, the so-called seas, after the oceans on the earth. And this is something that was repeated over and over again later in lunar history. And this is just, uh, just to show you what uh, his observatory looked like. It's not anything like a modern astronomical observatory that we're familiar with today. Uh, in fact, he built this on top of his house and two adjacent houses. And it was open to the, to the elements. And I would just imagine that making any observations with this contraption that he built must have been extremely difficult. OK, so next what I'd like to do is kind of discuss some of the common ideas that people had during the 1700s and the 1800s. And one of the first ideas, which is what I already mentioned with Hevelius, is that the craters on the moon were actually giant volcanoes. And I think that this idea was kind of inspired by the, the way that the aristocracy uh, uh, had uh, sent their, their, in essence, their children abroad to, 
for a grand tour throughout Europe. And as part of this grand tour and part of their educational process, they would, they would inevitably end up in places like Naples and they would see Vesuvius or they would end up uh, uh, seeing Etna. And every once in a while, these volcanoes erupt and these eruptions were written down and drew and published in the popular and scientific press at the time. And people were very excited about these things because this is something that's not really known if you don't live next to an erupting volcano. In any case, the, the, as you can see in this diagram on the right with the aristocrats uh, walking around an exploding volcano, <laughs> which I'm sure was very uh, safe, uh, th you have a circular feature and that people thought that these circular features of, such as the top of this mountain of Vesuvius was similar to these circular craters on the moon. Now, also at this time, there was a, a general idea that things on the moon change over time. And this is, has a long history. And one of the first observations of changes on the moon comes from these monks in 1100s, where they were looking up the, at the moon and saw some kind of explosion that lasted for quite a long time. Now, many people have said these monks were probably drinking and were drunk at the time. But later in time, there were several respectable scientists who made similar types of observations. So going back to Leonardo da Vinci, uh, when he was looking at the moon, he, he thought he saw clouds. William Herschel, he was a famous astronomer who discovered the planet Uranus. And he uh, actually claimed to have seen three actively erupting volcanoes on, on the surface of the moon. Other people saw things like vegetation or things appearing and disappearing over time. And even up until the 1960s, there are two geologists in the United States at the United States Geological Survey who claimed to have witnessed a volcanic eruption. And the third idea that was kind of common at this time is that there was probably life on the moon. And if there wasn't life, it was at least a topic that was worth uh, considering. And one of the first people that, or one of the more prominent people that suggested this was Johannes Kepler, who is famous for discovering the laws of motion of the, of the planets in our solar system. And he speculated on what these inhabitants of the moon would look like. And he thought that the surface of the moon would be very hot during the day. So they would have to hide in the shadows and they would build these circular craters where they could, you know, in essence, hide, hide themselves from the hot sun. Now, also William Herschel, as I mentioned before, this famous astronomer, uh, as a typical astronomer, he thought that the moon was very, very boring. But at the same time, since he believed that there was life on the moon, he thought that this justified studying the moon. And then there were some other people who were maybe a bit more imaginative, somewhat similar to this uh, film by George Méliès on Voyage dans la Lune. And they, uh, they thought that they saw inhabitants constructing roads and walled cities and things like ponds and lakes and so on. Okay, so I think things started to change in the 1900s, uh, partially as a result of the First and Second World Wars. Now, before this time, most people believed that these circular craters on the moon were probably volcanic in origin. But the people who were involved in, the, in these wars started to see these explosion craters um, that had a very striking resemblance to the craters on the moon. And the idea kind of slowly caught wind that perhaps these craters on the moon were the result of asteroids which collided with the moon uh, at very high velocities and liberated a large amount of energy in a very short period of time, creating an explosion. And this is just on the right-hand side, this is showing one of these examples of an explosion crater um, from World War I. This was, a, this was formed in 1916. It, you, it's a crater that's about 100 meters in diameter and it's uh, locate, located today in Northern France. So you can actually go to this crater today and actually look at it. And I, you'd be very hard pressed to find any differences between this explosion crater on the right and this crater on the moon on the left. Now, this idea that the craters were formed by asteroid impacts, I think was finally proven in 1960. And what happened here is that some scientists went to Meteor, Meteor Crater. It's a, cr a crater that's about a kilometer across in Arizona in the United States. And they found a mineral called coesite, which is in essence a phase transformation of quartz. And 
the important thing is that coesite can only form at extremely high pressures. And under the, in fact, you'd need pressures uh, that would come from something like an asteroid impact. You, can, you do not, in general, get the high pressures from volcanic eruptions. So you never find this mineral coesite in volcanic, in volcanic craters. Now, if you didn't believe uh, this coesite story, well, it turns out you just need to go to this crater and walk around the rim and you can pick up pieces of metal. And this metal is very, very similar to me uh, iron meteorites. And that's, in fact, these, this iron metal is just remnants of the projectile that formed this crater and which survived the impact. Okay, so things changed uh, dramatically in October 4th, 1957 with the launch of Sputnik 1, which was the first, the first man-made uh, satellite put in orbit around the Earth. Now this satellite here, uh, it really caused the Americans to, to have a, a moment of reflection where they were afraid that the Soviet Union was progressing faster than they were. So this launch was in fact the seed of the space race where the United States and the Soviet Union were trying to outdo each other to prove which political system uh, was the best. Now at this time, uh, it's important to point out that up until this time when, uh, when humans looked up in the sky, this is what they saw. This is just a picture of the near side of the moon. We have the familiar dark regions, the so-called mare or the seas. And we have the white regions, which are the, the so-called highlands or the continents. But the far side of the moon was almost completely unknown until exactly two years after Sputnik, when the Soviet Union launched Luna 3 in 1959 and photographed for the first time the far side of the moon. Now here, what I'm showing on the left is the, one of the original photographs taken from Luna 9. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing a reproduction of what this spacecraft would have seen using more modern image, imagery from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And what you can see is that on the near side in the previous picture, roughly one third of the near side of the moon is covered by these dark seas. But on the far side of the moon, there are very few of these black regions called the mare. And this immediately told us that the near side of the moon and the far side of the moon were dramatically different. And in fact, even today, a scientists like myself are still uh, investigating this and trying to find out what is the origin of this difference between the two hemispheres of the moon. And I have to say that we don't have any real good ideas. Okay, so about two years after this, the Soviet Union put uh, Yuri Gagarin into orbit around the earth. And then a couple months after that, the, uh, the president of the United States, John F. Kennedy, he made a speech to Congress where he proposed that the only way that we would be able to win the space race would be to put humans on the surface of the moon at the end of the decade of the 1960s. Now, before doing this, uh, we, need, we had, it's important to point out that we had no idea what the surface of the moon was like. And we had no idea whether it was safe to land on. Some scientists were claiming that the moon had thick layers of dust on the surface and that if an astronaut stepped on the surface, they would just sink through this dust layer and would would die in essence. So NASA, what they did is they had a couple programs to try to investigate what the surface of the moon was actually composed of. And this program, the first one is called Ranger, where they just took a rocket and shot it straight at the moon and took video images and sent them directly back to Earth in real time. And have you seen this uh, in loop? And here, just in a couple of seconds, splat. And here, what I'm showing is one of is is the last image from the Ranger 8 mission. This is an image that was taken about 60 kilometers away from the future Apollo 11, 11 landing site. Uh, the altitude of the spacecraft at this point was 3.7 kilometers. The width of this image is about 400 meters, and the spatial resolution of this image is roughly about 50 centimeters. So just by looking at this image here, we can see that the surface of the moon appears to be relatively benign. It's just kind of rolling uh, hills um, and there aren't any weird things like big rocks or crevasses or spires sticking out of the moon. So just based on this image, things look like landing on the moon was a, a, something that could be done. 
And this is, in fact, what happened uh, shortly after this. This was the Luna 9 mission from the Soviet Union, where they landed the first spacecraft on the moon on February 3rd, 1966. And the first important point is that this spacecraft, in fact, landed. And after it landed, it took some images, and I'm showing one of the panor panoramas that was taken from this. So the lander did not sink through a thick layer of dust. And if you just look at these images here, the surface of the moon looks relatively benign. We can see some rocks on the surface, but nothing that's uh, too, that, that doesn't seem like it's too dangerous. And shortly after this, uh, NASA did the same thing. They had the surveyor program where they successfully landed five spacecraft on the moon between June 2nd, 1966 and January 10th, 1968. And on the right-hand side, we, have, we can see some better quality photographs of the moon's surface. And we can see that, yes, in fact, there is a dusty layer on the surface of the moon, but this dusty layer is only a couple centimeters thick. And if you look on the left-hand side here, you'll see that the surface of the moon appears to be just a, a layer of broken up small rocky materials. So to me, this looks like it's pretty safe for an astronaut to walk around on. And at the same time, uh, NASA put five spacecraft in the orbit around the moon where they took images of the entire surface of the moon, both on the near side and on the far side. And the resolution of these images was better than about 60 meters. And where they were thinking of putting astronauts on the surface, they even got uh, images with resolutions down to about one meter. And here I'm just showing one uh, oblique image, which is kind of dramatic, of the Copernicus impact crater. This is an impact crater that is about 90 kilometers across and is about, about four kilometers deep. And just to put this in perspective, this crater is about twice as deep as the Grand Canyon. So if you're a geologist, there is a lot of interesting geology to be done on the moon just by looking at images like this. And then using these uh, global images, data set that we have from Lunar Orbiter, uh, geo uh, scientists were able to make a different type of map of the moon. Previously, I showed the maps of Galileo and of Hevelius, which are mostly just a, a reproduction of what the, the eye sees. But this, what I'm showing here, is the first geologic map of the near side of the moon. And what's interesting about a geologic map is that you, every a colored uh, portion of this map corresponds to a different geologic unit. And you just need to look at the legend of this map. And the legend will tell you how this unit formed or how we think it formed. And it will also give you an idea of how old the unit is, or at least its relative uh, age. And based, based on using maps like this, the scientists at the time were able to pick interesting regions where we might want to send uh, astronauts to the surface to do some interesting science on the surface. And also at this time, before the Apollo missions started, uh, there was also a debate as to what was the origin of the dark regions of the moon, the so-called seas or the mare. And the debate was that some people thought that these black regions, the seas, were just portions of the crust that were melted by large impact events. And there were other people who thought that these seas were actually just lava flows, uh, similar to the lava flows that we see on the Earth. And this was an acrimonious debate between two uh, famous people at the time, uh, Harold Urey and Jared Kuiper. Kuiper. And Yuri, on the one hand, he thought that the moon was just an, a boring, cold, dead object that formed at the same time as the Earth. It was captured in the Earth orbit and never melted. And at the Maria, it were just formed by these external events of impacts hitting the surface of the moon. And Kuiper, on the other hand, he thought that the moon was more like the Earth. It was a hot object. It had radioactive heating in it that was heating up its interior. It caused portions of the mantle to melt, giving rise to basaltic eruptions. And also this heating caused the moon to differentiate into a crust and mantle and core, similar to the structure of the Earth. So it would take the, we'd, so we'd have to wait until the Apollo missions to see which person was right. And just gonna, show you a very quick movie of the launch of Apollo 11, which is pretty impressive. Ten, nine, mission sequence 
Okay, so if you're interested in the technological aspects of the Apollo program, I highly advise you. You see this a movie called Apollo 11, which came out a couple years ago. And it's using restored documentary footage from the time. And this movie uh, is truly amazing. Um, so I highly advise you to see this. Okay, so, but back to the science. So Apollo, uh, the Apollo missions, the Apollo missions landed on the moon's surface six times. Uh, the first one was Apollo 11, where the astronauts only spent one day on the surface of the moon. And of this one day, they only spent two and a half hours outside of the lunar module uh, walking around on the surface. And during this time, they only walked about one kilometer and they only got a couple of 10, 20 kilograms of rocks. For the next two missions, the Apollo 12 and 14 missions, they spent two days on the lunar surface. And with each of these missions, they spent about eight hours outside working on, on the moon surface uh, outside of the lunar module. And in these cases, they walked about four kilometers and collected even larger quantities of lunar samples. And then for the last three missions, they spent three days on the lunar surface. And because of an electric roving vehicle, which is not too different from a modern Tesla, um, they were actually able to cover distances up to about 36 kilometers. And with the last of these missions, the Apollo 17 mission, they collected 110 kilograms of lunar samples that were brought back to, brought back to Earth. Okay, so it's important to point out that the astronauts, even though they are, were in essence test pilots, uh, they were trained to be geologists. And they were trained so that they could actually pick up interesting rocks on the moon's surface. And importantly, when they're on the surface, they spend a lot of time documenting, documenting the collection of each sample. And then once these samples were brought back to the earth, they were put into these stainless steel glove boxes that was filled with the nitrogen atmosphere. And this was to ensure that people never really touched the rocks with their hands and also that the rocks didn't come in contact with the earth's atmosphere, which has water in it and oxygen and which can alter and oxidize the, the samples. Now, because of this, the Apollo samples are still being analyzed today, and there's still been uh, major discoveries being made about the moon every couple of years because of the way that these samples were collected and stored. And I should also point out that the Soviet Union, uh, even though they did not land humans on the surface of the moon, they did collect some samples using robotic means. Uh, this is from the Luna 16, 20, and 24 missions where they had three missions which collected about 100 grams of materials for each of these sample robotic sample return missions. Now, even though these missions collected only grams, hundreds of grams of materials, it, it's important to point out that these rocks are really important because they came from regions of the moon that are far away from the Apollo region. And in fact, we know in retrospect that the composition of the surface where these Soviet uh, missions collected samples was much different than the composition of the surface where the Apollo astronauts went to. Okay, so what did we learn from the lunar rocks? Well, in essence, we learned that there are two types of rocks. There are white rocks and there are black rocks. The white rocks come from the white bright regions of the moon called the highlands. And it turns out that these rocks are uh, called the northocytes. They're a rock that's made of almost entirely out of a mineral called anorthite. And these rocks, we can actually find them on the earth, but they're pretty rare. But what's really interesting about the lunar anorthocytes is that they're extremely old. Uh, they formed about 4.4 billion years ago. And this is roughly the same age as the age of the earth and the age of the moon. Now with the black rocks in contrast, these rocks are uh, appear, they, they are just a, a volcanic lava flows with compositions that are very similar to the basaltic lavas that we find on the earth. So if you go to any uh, major volcano on earth like Hawaii, uh, Iceland, or La Reunion, or Guadeloupe, or anything like that, you will find rocks that are not too different in composition from these black Mare basaltic rocks that were collected on the moon. Now, it turns out that these are also very interesting because they're old. They're about 3.5 billion years old, but they're considerably younger than the white, bright, the continental crust of the moon. And if you remember the story about uh, Yuri and Kuiper, it turns out that Kuiper was right. These rocks are actually lavas, and they were not formed by melting the crust by impact events.
as Yuri suggested. Okay, so in addition to uh, bringing back samples uh, from the moon surface to, to Earth, the Apollo astronauts also left some scientific experiments on the surface of the moon. And this is what's called the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package, or short for uh, ALSEP for short. And this image here, I'm just showing that each of these ALSEP stations had a central station where they collected all the data from the scientific experiments and then radioed the data back to the Earth. And then this central station was powered by a radioisotope thermal electric generator, which could generate power for roughly a decade time period. So what types of experiments did we put on the surface of the moon? Well, perhaps one of the most interesting ones was we put a seismometer on the moon at four different locations. And what we found is that the moon is in fact seismically active. And here I'm just showing one of these uh, seismograms of a moon quake, which is analogous to an earthquake. Now, just as we use seismic data on the Earth to investigate the interior structure of the Earth, uh, lunar scientists can use these moon quakes to investigate the interior structure of the moon. And I'm just showing a diagram here of what our most modern representation of the interior structure of the moon is most likely. And it's a structure that's similar to the Earth. We have a crust a mantle, and a core, an iron metal core. And the big difference here is that it turns out that the core of the moon is somewhat small, is, is considerably smaller than the core of the Earth. Now, another experiment we put on the surface of the moon were magnetometers. And here we measured the magnetic field at four different landings, at four different places on the moon. And what we found is that the crust of the moon was highly magnetic in some places. And not only that, uh, we found after the fact by analyzing the, the lunar samples that some of the lunar samples are also highly magnetic. And this suggests that the moon at one point in its ancient history had a global magnetic field that was derived from the core, uh, very similar to the, to, the, to the magnetic field that we have today that, uh, for the Earth. Now, I have to say that scientists are still investigating this problem. It's not exactly clear when the moon's uh, uh, dynamo magnetic field turned on and when it turned off, nor how strong the dynamo was over time. So there's lots of things that we're still uh, working on today. Another experiment we placed on the surface was a heat flow experiment. And in essence, what we did here is the astronauts drilled a core about three meters deep below, below the surface, which is shown in the bottom portion of the left image here. And then the astronauts, as shown in the right here, they put, in essence, a thermometer into this core and measured the temperature and, and how the temperature increased with depth below the surface. And this is really important because if you want to understand how the moon was hot enough in its past to melt the mantle to give rise to these lava flows that we see on the surface, you need to understand what the interior temperature of the moon is. And this is just showing that working on the moon actually isn't very easy. That the astronauts are in these pressurized suits and you have low gravity. And this is just showing one of the more dramatic fails of the astronaut to Jack Schmidt at as part of the Apollo 17 mission. Okay, and the last uh, experiment I'll talk about is the lunar laser ranging retro reflectors that were placed on the surface of the moon. And in essence, these are just passive instruments. It's just a box about like this, this big with a bunch of small little corner cube reflectors. And the idea is that when you shoot a laser at these corner cube reflectors, the laser beam gets reflected directly back at you. So what we do is we take, uh, we have these very powerful lasers at observatories on the earth. Here I'm showing one from the Observatoire de la Côte d'Azur, which is where I work. We shoot a laser at the moon. We wait to see how long it takes for, for the reflection to come back. And then since we know what the speed of light is, we could determine the distance between the earth and the moon very precisely. And I should point out that the Apollo program placed three retro reflectors on the surface of the moon. And the Soviet Union also placed two additional retro reflectors, which were mounted on the Lunokhod 1 and 2 rovers, as shown in the upper right image here. So what do we see with the lunar laser ranging data? Well, this is just kind of an image showing like what kind of signals that we detect with the, with the Earth-Moon distance. 
we see that the moon is kind of wobbling back and forth in latitude and longitude and is getting closer and farther away because of the moon's eccentricity. And what we see is that the moon has some slight mutations which are superposed on top of these wobbles. And based on the amplitudes of these mutations, we can infer that the moon has a molten iron core that's uh, that, um, deep below the surface. Also, because of the tides that the moon raises on the Earth, the moon is slowly receding away from the, from the Earth at a rate of 3.8 centimeters per year. Now, it's also important to point out that the lunar laser, laser ranging experiment is the only experiment that is still working on the surface of the moon today. And the reason for this is that it's a passive instrument and doesn't require any power to, to keep things alive. And also, as time went on, the accuracy between the Earth and the moon distance is getting more and more accurate. And today, the accuracies that people are that have when making these measurements is roughly about two centimeters. So it's, it's really an impressive experiment. OK, so we're getting close to the end of my talk. And this is a, just to say that the Apollo 17 missions ended, the Apollo missions ended very abruptly. Um, the last crewed mission to the moon was the Apollo 17 mission in 1972. Um, after this, the LSEP stations, because they were powered by these radio isotope thermoelectric generators, they were able to collect data for another several years until NASA turned them off in 1977. And also the last Soviet mission was a robotic sample return mission to the moon, Luna 24 in 1976. And then it, after this point, the moon was simply ignored for roughly two decades. And the question people always have is, if the Apollo program was so successful, why did they just stop? Why didn't they continue exploring the moon? Um, and I don't think there's a single answer to this question. It's really a number of factors that all came together at the same time. And the first is that the Apollo program from its conception was always a political program for the United States to, to, to win the so-called space race, which they did. And there was never really a political consensus as what they were going to do afterwards. Secondly, the Apollo program, as you can imagine, it was ex extremely expensive. And people at the time were thinking that maybe we could use this money better on Earth to help solve problems like poverty and homelessness and things like that. Um, also, the public at the time was starting to be focused on other issues. Uh, the United States uh, was, was uh, in a proxy war in Vietnam at the time. The Pentagon Papers were recently published, and also the Watergate burglary happened between the Apollo 16 and 17 missions. So people were worried about political domestic issues at the time. And also, uh, to be honest, the, the public did lose interest in seeing humans walk on the moon uh, with each successive Apollo mission. And scientists also, they moved on to other things and started exploring other objects like Mars and Venus and and Mercury and the outer, outer solar system. So it wasn't until 1994 where humans started to be, have become interested in the moon again. And this started with the United States with the launch of the Clementine mission in 1994, which was just a spacecraft put in orbit around the moon. And then following this, the, the, the United States launched, uh, I think a total of about seven missions uh, since, since this time. Uh, it's, also, this diagram here is, shows that there are a large number of countries which are interested in lunar exploration today. Uh, in the past, it was really a race between the United States and the Soviet Union. And as you can see here, the Soviet Union is not on this, this, this diagram. Uh, Soviet Union doesn't exist, but Russia is not on this diagram either. So just to give you an idea that other countries that are in, interested in lunar exploration, ESA, they launched a spacecraft to the moon in 2003. It's the European Space Agency. Uh, China, they launched five uh, space, uh, so five satellites to the moon. Three of them landed on the surface, and one of them actually collected samples and brought them back to the Earth. This was the last one that was launched last year. Japan, they launched one satellite, which was put into orbit around the moon in 2007. Israel, they attempted to land a spacecraft on the moon in 2019. They got very, very close, but unfortunately, this, this failed at the last minute. In India also, they put a spacecraft in orbit around the moon in 2008, and also attempted to land something on, to, in, on the surface in 2019, which unfortunately uh, didn't work. Okay, so for the future after this, what should we expect? 
Um, I think there's probably a lot of younger people in the audience who are hoping that they will see something like this. This is a, just a, an image that was drawn in support of the, the science fiction series, The Expanse. Uh, people might hope that we will have these bases on the moon with thousands of people living there and with spacecraft going back and forth between the Earth and the moon. But I think we need to be more realistic. And I think this is kind of what we should expect to see within our lifetime. This is an, a lunar outpost where we have a small number of people living permanently on the surface. Portions of this outpost will be built with materials brought from the Earth to the lunar surface. And we will also use some of the lunar materials like the regolith in order to help construct these, these habitats. Now, I'm not exactly certain which country will be building these outposts, but it's certain to me that this will be an international endeavor and that it will not be only one country like the United States or the Soviet Union like it was in the past. So that's it, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.